Hello, welcome to the Spaceship Earth Mission Log. Today we have Julian Latsana from the Community Homesteading as Comprehensive Ecosocial Realignment Project. Welcome. Hey, thanks so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. All right, so we're here to talk about our mission and our pro- the projects we worked on. And yours is interesting because you said, well, I still want to talk, but we didn't end up presenting. And so, you know, I guess what we should start with is what your mission is. And then we can talk about some of the hurdles that were encountered. And also, I just basically want to talk about what you do because... Earth and Heart LLC is something that's already in action. And you had mentioned that on your mission profile that you have really started it, that it's something you've been doing for over 10 years and had zero interest when, well, almost no interest when it started. And now you have so much demand that you can't keep up with it. So mm. you're really looking for help getting this thing that's already happening, this work you're already doing, going and going stronger. So I want to talk about even ongoing beyond the space camp, part of the purpose of Spaceship Earth Mission Log is getting to network together more and to give people a deeper knowledge of what you're already doing so that we're not so siloed and individualized, but we actually have the ability to communicate and collaborate. So, yeah. Julian, tell me about Earth and Heart and uh, tell me about the community homesteading mission. All right. So in a nutshell, I guess, historically bought the land in 2011. At that point, I was in a rather large blended family. I met a woman at Arco Santi in Arizona who was in charge of the gallery day-to-day operations. They fund that project off of selling bells, ceramic and bronze bells, which is a social enterprise that generates money for the nonprofit, which is our Cosanti and Cosanti Foundation. So I was there doing some grad work, a practicum study, work study there at our Cosanti. So I met Palma there. She was working in the gallery and I wooed her from her boyfriend at the time. And for some reason, I was not phased by the fact that she had five kids. Wow. And I proceeded and, and we had two of our own. And uh, huh. so at that point, 2011, there was nine of us and we got the land and we had looked at other eco villages at that point around eugene oregon contacted one here in kalamazoo called lake village you know reached out to a few existing communities things didn't lock in surprisingly i don't know if they were daunted by our our horde our brood we were you know a pretty big <laughs> crew um and i think legally you can't say anything about that but Sometimes I wonder if it was, you know, we would have on some level pretty much taken over some of these communities. So we ended up uh, deciding to get our own property and we looked around Portland for a while and put in a couple of bids on places there, but it was like a bidding war at that point and and nothing, you couldn't get anything that made any sense for us. And I, and I was excited to be closer to my family with some new Mm. Uh, especially my mom was excited to be a grandmother. So, Oh, I bet. Moved back to Michigan. Land was cheaper. And so we got land with the understanding that we were going to be building a, a community type of homestead. We didn't have the naming for it and whatnot, but we hosted slowly through the Wolf Network, Worldwide Opportunities for Organic Farmers. And there's there's quite a few other ones out there, IC.org and Global Eco Village Network. So I put some posts up and pretty quickly we started getting people coming out, but it was almost nobody from the area. It was like literally people from Siberia, Australia, the UK, but like nobody from, you know, nearby cities and stuff almost. Um, right. So that, that was interesting. And just internally, some the dynamics with the family didn't really play out uh, maybe as we had hoped. There was some difference in terms of how to coordinate farm chores, let's say, um, Mm. without getting too deep into the personal stuff. But Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty hard when you've got that many kids that are shuttling back and forth to school and sports and going to friends and stuff to get anyone to feel engaged enough in the farm life and, and all the things. So for me, anyway, it felt a lot like I was the only one that was into this show, you know, 
Mm. And, um, mm-hmm. and when you've got uh, that many people who are not really on board, we shifted things and she moved into town. And mm-hmm. um, so then that opened up more possibility in terms of me for hosting others. So hmm. that part of it expanded and really kept me going. I don't know that I would have been, there's no way I could have handled it if I didn't have other people coming out there and people would be so excited when they come like yeah. bring I'm like looking at this messy barn and goats that are a pain in the neck and somebody comes out and they're like, Oh, this is so great. I'm like, yeah, I guess it is. Isn't it? You know? So just getting that perspective from people, even if they were there just for a weekend or a week, yeah, would just be transformative um, and, and keep me going, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, you know, locking in the business model and having some struggles, hosting people for longer periods as the years went on, who had different personal or substance abuse problems or, mm. you know, quite a few dynamics that you can hear about. Uh, it's a common recurring themes within these types of communities. I've got, you know, over 10 years of kind of learning about all those things right, that, that come up. And so at this point, somewhere along the line, I feel like it was 2014, but I don't know the exact year. You registered it as an LLC to, to sort of get it off of my own personal attachment in an attempt to share the ownership. As of now, that hasn't lined up. There's been some discussion back and forth with the current tenants about land contract or them becoming members of the LLC who would then be co-owners of the property. And Mm -hmm. we really haven't locked in an arrangement yet, but the rental situation is really mutually beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's about six months ago. I'm like, why are we so focused on like what it isn't? instead right. of like celebrating what it is. And I'm like, hmm. where else is there affordable, sustainable housing in the area or probably even in the country, you know, that's mm. not subsidized housing and right. it's not nothing to say, nothing bad about that necessarily, but this particular type of housing is almost unavailable. So of I'm course, like, yeah. Why am, I, why am I complaining about something that's so great? You know, like not that it couldn't be, Right. So you're seeing you're seeing the scalable nature of something within that particular space in terms of the the land use. And and you can't get this type of living situation other ways. So there's a need there. Yeah. And now that things have, you know, what I was talking about a little bit ago was kind of five to 10 years ago. So now that things have shifted into a new dynamic where there's, let's say, another cycle of urban flight on some level i don't know if it's that that might be a strong wording but on some level a lot of people are interested again in like getting a farm and you know all the rural land lands have been kind of a lot of them have been bought up and so people are just now on some level where i was over 10 years ago oh people are getting there i had a friend who 15 years years ago was talking about starting an artist town and he was like an odd duck then and now it's like he's kind of moved on and i'm like dude you need to go back and you need to see what people are doing they're they're into this stuff now and you know so but you know you mentioned some of the challenges you mentioned arcosante and some of those other communities you know there there is a community aspect to community homesteading and I think the interpersonal aspect, um, you can end up with all kinds of challenges, especially as an organizer or as the person whose name is on the the land in that case. And, uh, you know, I'm curious, I'm curious what, without going into personal details, like what what were some of those challenges and what are some of the instances where you found those challenges solved when you moved on down the line? Yeah, I don't mind getting personal. I just won't use any specific names if, if there's, you know... The possibility of tension there. Because I feel like the social aspect is something we need to learn to design for. Absolutely. And I feel like with a design science approach to it, you can identify approaches that create a more improved situation all around. Yeah. So I guess I would see two extremes that are, for most people, undesirable. One of them is the American dream, which is for most people tends ends up being a nightmare, which is single family home, the illusion of two parents raising this perfect family 
and environmentally a massive impact. So right. a lot, infrastructurally really damaging to the earth. But that's sort of one extreme. And then the other extreme would basically be a bunch of hippies piled on top of each other. Right. Sharing yeah. everything. Like every meal is shared together. Everybody works together all the time. They, you know, very rustic kind of back to the land, primitive kind of living. I'd say sort those of works are, if everybody shares like very narrow ideology, like everyone's got to. Kind if of you're agree. lucky, yeah. So those to me are like the polar extremes, and if those work for somebody, that's cool. Um, <laughs> and if it's offensive to somebody, I'm sorry, but that's just kind uh-huh. of like to paint the picture. Is like leave it to Beaver and like a bunch of hippies camping out. Those are the two yeah. extremes that well most put. people don't want. Most that's people well want put. something in the middle. Right, And that, that something in the middle is a large amount of, and I'm talking about specific to my culture, I guess, which is Michigan, you know, and the United States of America. I don't want to say that it's totally relevant to everybody everywhere, but in this particular context, most people want a fair amount of independence, private space, and some type of ability to be in a natural setting where at least some for some period of time there's like solace or alone space so like i can go for right. a walk and there's not like hundreds of people or i can go to a a building and just kind of meditate or like some ability to have private space like peace um, and quiet yeah so that's yeah. like part of the culture of rural america is is that right. so yeah. In order to honor that rather than fight against it and try to sell something to people that they don't really want, um, yeah. I would say the community homestead model is is in between. It's potentially like a series of very, uh, maybe not tiny homes, but something like a tiny home, an eco building that isn't super extravagant. You know, you got what you need, right. but um it's pretty humble. But a lot of the things that you need are around you. So there's their shared right. resources. So you have you your own building time. and then you have like a shared space when you want it. A fair amount of, uh, you know, shared gardens, shared uh, livestock, uh, shared machines in the barn, um, a, an ability to walk to your neighbors, <laughs> uh, multiple people. But the community homestead, for some people, it might be three families so that, right. you know, you're with people that you can trust. So um, mm-hmm. if you have children, then you don't have to you can go out once a week, which is a big if you deal. Have children, the children can play with each other. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the parents can sort of get together and just let the kids play, which is huge because in the Beaver, in the Leave it to Beaver model, since you can't let your kids run around the neighborhood anymore, it's not 1950. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, you're, obvi- you're honestly parenting in silos and the exhaustion of both parents working and raising uh, two to three kids, you know, alone is just like, it's crazy making. Absolutely insane. Yeah. And, it's not sustainable. It energetically is just so draining. I agree. So that's yeah. one model. Another model might be intergenerational. You know, maybe yeah. there's maybe there's instead of that that last example might be even twenty people, ten to twenty people, three families. You know, um, mm-hmm. the other example uh, could be intergenerational living, where there's a real focus on having elders in the community uh, who share mm-hmm. their wisdom and having you know three generations. Uh, presence that could be a focus another one could be uh people who really like to hunt or people who are vegans or you know um so they <laughs> there's an example of, of two communities that probably wouldn't be one of those three families to get you know the hunters and no the have and have one that's for one and you know but maybe right yeah. down the road is the vegans from the hunters and and maybe yeah. they even actually occasionally go to a community event they wouldn't want to live together Right. Uh, yeah. But you can respect somebody's choices, hopefully, if they're down the road and far enough away from you, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Setting when actually, a, I think that's something to. Tone. Yeah, I think that's something to bring up is that a lot of times, 
you know, we look at the distance as the enemy, but in some cases you can use distance or, uh, you know, uh, big, you know, dividing things to your advantage. Um, we were mm. talking in the uh, mission in the first space camp I did, we had a, a future cities mission and they were looking at Burning Man as an experiment. They were saying, you know, it gets really noisy in certain places, you know, and some people want some quiet. And I'm mm. like, well, what if you move the RVs in a way where they pr provide a natural barrier for the wind? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, also create a sense of safety because it's kind of an enclosure. It kind of gives you, you know, you're only looking to the outside, but this behind you is kind of the safety. So, you know, you can mm. use this sense of like planned planned spaces, intentional distance, you know, some things you want close, some things you want, you know, like the peace and quiet aspect that you talked about. And other times you need community and you need interaction. And right. so your spaces can somewhat design for that. So it's like you're, you're, I love how you're designing for the idea of what is, what people are looking for in your own area in terms of there's a certain ethos that people have about, you know, what they get out of modern American life. And there's things mm. that they're innately looking for and maybe things that they're innately looking to get away from. And so you're trying to find the like the bridge mm. between those two things. So I love that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And I, I want to definitely give props to Arco Santi and and the vision of archaeology that uh, Paolo Soleri left to us. Fellow space camper Carl Welty and I have been talking and having some really good conversations. Um, oh, cool. And we're in we're in uh, communication with Dave Tallis, who lives at Arco Santi, and he's been there since I've known about Arco Santi. Um, but they, you talk about building spaces for interaction. Uh, I'd say archaeology is quite masterful at that, where mm. you've got the dense urban cluster. Outside mm -hmm. of that, you've got farmlands. Outside of that, you've got wilderness. If you mm. want to go somewhere else, you just walk to the high speed rail and go to another community. But within the it. city, there's no cars and you can walk it. to the farmland or to the country within like 10 minutes. I love it. Cause the human habitat is like densely compact, but it's done in a way that's integrated with nature. And so on some level, what I've, well, on a lot of levels, what I've been working on is highly inspired by that, but it's like uh -huh. a, ru a rural, uh, component to the urban design. Paolo didn't really care about what happened in the country or in the wilderness. That wasn't what his trip was about. So right. he more yeah. or less just totally neglected or the social dynamics of social governance, how to get good ideas integrated into the community aspect of it. He just didn't care about it. Oh, so interesting. That was always a tension when he was alive. And you were uh -huh. living there. That was always an ongoing tension is that it was very hierarchical and there was no way to for most people mm -hmm. to get their ideas integrated. Uh, you know, it's my story, but it's not just my story. A lot of people would right. probably concur. Others, others would probably disagree. But either mm -hmm. way, very hierarchical um, setup. And, you know, there was just things that he wasn't really interested in. And one of them was community governance. Another one was what happened down in camp. He was just like, he didn't care. Right, um, right. Which in some ways made it the freest place to be huh? because he was not involved in it. But it also right. made it so that whatever you're doing didn't really have sort of uh, any real connection to the nuts and bolts of what the organization was promoting, mm -hmm. supporting. It was sort of like fringe, you know, it was left to the fringe kind of. That makes sense. What uh, what were since you lived in Arcosante, and a lot of people are very interested in that place yeah. and that experiment. Um, can you tell us what were some of the challenges? Besides, you mentioned uh, there was no plan for the governance of the group. Um, what were some of the other challenges that you found in living in a idealized uh, urban design like that? Yeah. So there there were community meetings once a day. I think it was like at ten forty. Well. It was before lunch, so sometime around eleven in the morning, there was a morning meeting, and then there were uh, there were a lot of meetings. So I don't want to say that there was no place for it. I just say structurally, a lot of people felt like there wasn't a way for them to integrate their opinions or their mm -hmm. 
a lot a lot of people came with the idea that it was some kind of eco village and it definitely was not an eco village um mm. sort of a take in the it sense, or leave it approach to the you like it here absolutely you don't like it here. yeah he even had a saying it was uh if you don't like this, there's another mesa over there, you know, because it's a, it's like a high desert plateau. It's built in it. Yeah, there's plenty of places. He he chose a location and he had his vision. And if you like uh-huh. it, you can stay. If 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 you got something that's like a real beef for you and you can't deal with it, well, there's plenty of other places to go. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's there was that aspect. Um, so you were talking about challenges with it. Yeah, is that what you said? Yeah. Well, I was there um, specifically to look at the the leadership component of it. So I was working with the ALT group at the time it was called, um, Arcosanti Leadership Team. Uh, so it was a pretty small group of people who were like upper management and just working on like a strategic audit basically for them. So, and I worked in the archives. I worked in which is an amazing resource. Um, hopefully it'll be like the Frank Lloyd Wright archives or I don't know what the yeah. Bucky Fuller digitized archives are, but like point. in a yeah. digitized, but also like the analog copies, like in a museum setting. Cause it's a lot of yeah. work for them to keep it uh, safe on site. Um, so I worked, also worked in the kitchen and in camp. So in general people, you can kind of move around and try different things out. I like that about it. But the I was really fascinated with the agricultural component and how it did or did not connect with the cafe because they serve quite a few people in terms of the residents who live there and then the many many visitors who come for tours and and to buy bells and to just to check out yeah the project. I heard they like really didn't grow much of their own food. It was not a yeah. And I, so with Dave, interest, uh, Dave. I, th- I think it's moving in a good direction now. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm curious to keep that conversation going with my friend Dave Tallis, who's still there. But certainly at that time, it was pretty minimal and a lot of potential because they had, I believe, I don't know, but they had a lot of water and they had agricultural rights, which is very rare in that area to be able to grow and to have access mm. to water. Um, it was kind wow. of a rare, rare thing. Um, so it was a little surprising. You almost couldn't do it without the access to the water, too. Yeah. Oh, no. Really important. It'd be a nightmare. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's permacultural ways, obviously, um, mm-hmm. to grow trees or, or things. But to actually do scalable agriculture, definitely water is important. So yeah. that was that was a little bit of a challenge for me that there wasn't there weren't inroads to have that discussion. Uh, the truck came in from U.S. Foods, like everywhere else. Um, I worked as a chef for many years, actually. I've cooked for hundreds of people. and So I was interested in that that aspect of the project um, and a little frustrated that we were, you know, we're eating food from just generic U.S. Foods kind of quality. <laughs> truck. <food>. Yeah. When <laughs> we had land and we had people that wanted to do it, which is not, you yeah. know. It's from not U.S. As foods of all, all places. That. Yeah. Um, it's hard work, you know, and the project is largely an architectural project. So to take yeah. the limited amount of people that were there and to gear them up to become farmers, I could see how that would not be appealing, you know. Um, well, it's kind of a wisdom in just choosing one pro- one challenge right. instead yeah, of trying to solve all the challenges, although they all they all interconnect. And that's the, the paradox. I guess. So now I think that's really the interesting piece of the community homesteading aspect and why I am continue to be uh, interested in Arcosanti because I think as a, an experiment and a way to prototype things, I cannot think of a better place than Arcosanti. Like if they mm-hmm. could yeah. get more traction in the community homestead aspect in the rural property, that, that was referred to as camp. It probably still is. It's down mm. the hill from the city and then beautiful wilderness land around that. If that can be scaled up to the point where, let's say right now there's probably under 200 people living there. But if there was, you know, maybe if there's two or 300 people living there at least, and I don't know, at least 50% of the food is supplied from the site and they're selling mm-hmm. some of it to generate income. You know, what kind of, 
model would that be then for someplace like Florida or um, right. Phoenix? Yeah, because like, you mentioned just instead of building refugees. these yeah. horrendous tack me up, you know, places that won't last more than fifty years, like really sprawled out communities we've all seen them across america they're like a condominium type of thing like really big they don't have to be but some mm-hmm. of them are really big some of them are small but the, and they're not it's just super generic great. right i'll just go out and say it it's living in that is not ideal <laughs> some people apparently a lot of people like it or maybe there's not enough options but to do an arcology in one of these areas yeah um if the prototype is convincing enough uh, that's that's why I continue to to look upon Arcosanti, you know, as as, as that kind yeah. of model because I think it's unappealing to most people to live clustered in a human clustered area, you know, especially given viruses and violence and blah blah blah, all these kind of things that keep people from wanting to be next to each other. Um, mm-hmm. But if it's done, if it's prototyped in a way that is actually appealing then, you know, I could see that. I think the problem with condominium, the the problem with condominiums is you're living in a cluster of humans that you're not in community with. Right. And you're trying to not be, you're trying to just like not make contact with your neighbors as much (laughs) as possible. And there's no good common spaces. So like Uh when you want to go somewhere, when you want that peace and quiet aspect, you got your neighbor banging on the wall or, you know, loud music or, you know, some, somebody in their garage smoking or whatever's going on. And there, but there's not really great places to go around and walk and like, you know, Mm -hmm. let your kids play and things like that. You kind of got and you're kind of like in a very small space and it's not just a small space. Like, a small space is fine if you got somewhere out to go. And you're not very connected with nature right. usually because the nature's been cut off by whatever building project is happening. And, yeah, and you don't know your neighbors. And I think that's mm. – there is no conflict resolution. You know, I mean, I think you, you might, you know, if someone's – someone's tree or you know their their plants are growing over your wall or something like that maybe then you have to you know contact the board or something like that try not mm. to talk to the other person about it because that would be too you know that might cause yeah, problems it's, yeah it's like the goal of not interacting and yeah. i think that that leads to the fact that there's community everywhere and if we could transform the suburbs into a co-housing so the first place that's vacant make it into a community building start planting yeah. food crops you know tree crops in the in the properties along the road um so there's community a way gardens to, that's the thing yeah. that's already happening even in urban mm-hmm. spaces too and not just suburban yeah and it's so i think you know, even those even those places uh that we mentioned that we might not want i wouldn't want to continue to build communities like that i would i would say you know please stop you know especially driving <laughs> yeah. down to florida i can't believe it but anywhere can be transformed i just you know in the last six months i got to know one of my neighbors and we play music now together and it just feels so much more of a community having mm-hmm. one more neighbor that i can you know i had him i thought i might have left the tea kettle on and i was a half hour away i'm like dude can you just look in the window to make sure amazing I didn't you know like that's yeah. a big difference Amazing. So we can do it anywhere. It doesn't have to be in an arcology. It doesn't have to be in a community homestead. The point is to start talking to each other and being making space for different opinions. Like we don't, we're not going to agree about everything. And in, yeah. if we did, then we'd be. That's a different project. You know, that's the uh, the androids that all are programmed the same project. That's not the project on Earth. Project Earth is diversity. Um, and not just putting up with it, but like actually being intrigued and stimulated by that, like not just being annoyed by it, but actually like, huh, you like that. I wonder why I just so don't like that, but you like that. Hmm. It's interesting. Like not just, yeah. not, not just annoyed by it, but not like resistant or tolerant, but actually generally intrigued with the fact that somebody might really be into something that I'm just not into. Well, you know what that was like, for me? Or at least was making when space I heard the, for that. When I heard the quote about biodiversity, um, that concept of biodiversity um, applied to human diversity, it's what makes us robust as a human species. I mean, the fact that I'm not into tanning leather, 
um, doesn't mean that that's not something that someone is doing as a craft or, you know, whatever it is. You know, I, mm-hmm. I could use a better example that doesn't exclude animal rights. But I, I just think it's so important that we keep diverse knowledge within humanity. And, you know, some of these projects that have their flaws, like Arco Santi, where, you know, the, the founder of it, he's not into all the other stuff. He's a architect and he's making huge strides in architecture. And it's there's a, a social experiment going on around that. And so, like, taking that diversity and, okay, what can we learn from that? What can we do? I wanted to read a quote that um, I read that you wrote um, about the idea of re- uh, reviving suburban living. You mm-hmm. said, even in suburbia, by talking with neighbors, having potlucks, sharing tools, farming your yard, we can transform our reality rapidly with collective will. Mm. And I think that's true. I think, you know, we could just, you know, we it, it's it's appealing just the idea of just bulldozing everything and starting over, but the reality is no one's going to go for that. And and you're not going to you people aren't going to go along with it. It's going to be too up it's going to be too upending. And you know, some people may go join Arcosante or uh any of the other echo villages around and some people may not. Some people may be ready for something that they can't quite put their finger on, you know, but mm. but offering them the, you know, if they started looking at community homesteading, offering them a, a, a chance to go live there for six months or a year might be the bridge that they need. And they may take it that far or they may start their own later. You know, you never know what someone's individualized journey is going to take, but there's there's value in that, that not everybody has to do the nth degree of of this thing if we're going to really transform society together you know we have to include all of us and all of us aren't ready for the same things we're all in various degrees but just because someone a long time ago you know or just because someone now isn't ready for something doesn't mean 10 years from now like you you given the example right. of your your um community homesteading project like you know now there's more demand then you can fill. And so imagine what another 10 years will do, especially at the pace that things are changing now and some of the major um, mind shifts that were going on, whether we like it or not in the world. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think absolutely. it's, you know, it's we're a collective and as a collective things, it's like a pot boiling. You know, the pot, the part starts to boil, uh, but, you know, there's a long time where it's being heated. But if it's cold, it's cold. But I feel like we're heating. A lot of these ideas are starting to just, it's like popcorn. The people are just going to pop, 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 pop. And soon, you know, yeah. just the whole, the whole bag will be popped eventually. But right now, just starting to get the beginnings of the pops here and there. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I say that to encourage people because I know some people have been in this work for generations. And, um, you know, someone like me, I'm, I'm brand new. Um, like, uh, I honestly am just learning about all this stuff and I think it's fascinating. I think it's, it's needed. And so what's refreshing to me is to, to communi- communicate with you about these ideas and to learn about them and to, um, just see the potential in what's possible and what's happening and just to mm. see the shift happening to see the popcorn popping and the various people and um it's it's super inspiring i gotta say so yes. so there's two things that that brought up for me what you've been talking about is the i think it was that comment of mine was largely based on the infill concept probably of rather than um building new housing how do we infill what we already have like there's commercial properties all across the country that are vacant now because guess what? We realized over half the desk jobs, you really don't need to go to the office now. So yep. there's these empty office buildings and there's like miles from there, there's like a homeless encampment. I'm not saying right. it's that easy, but it's a little, you know, let's start thinking differently. Like maybe these places need to get rezoned and retooled yes. for, uh, you know, and, and and these things are happening, but. So that's like an infill concept of rather than um, worry about expanding, let's take what already exists in a, in a uh, suburban area. Can we like do some pretty extensive gardening and do some pretty extensive gardening and also perhaps uh, create a community building when, when one of the properties becomes vacant? 
talk to our neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than expanding, contracting, infilling, you know, and, and that's happening yeah. in urban areas, certainly in Detroit. And there's, it's not, I haven't seen a perfect example. There's usually uh, rough areas that uh, need room for good community dialogue. And that seems to be surprisingly hard to come by. But then that in relationship to the back casting concept of like, okay, so Arco, or, um, Arco Santi too, but uh, Earth and Heart LLC is like, I could sit there and be like, here's the vision and it's so far away from the vision and get frustrated about it's not there yet. Or I could just picture the vision, which I'm now kind of scaling. No, it's actually been pretty similar all along. The capacity to be about 20 people, 20 to 30 people, not high density, but increased density, incremental. So it's maybe another three to five buildings on the property and then another shared space outside. So hold that vision in place, some type of community ownership. So I'm not the only one on the deed. It's in a long-term land trust. The uh, the housing is permanently off the speculative market. It's limited equity housing. So that's mm-hmm. the vision. And then yeah. come back to where I am now, back casting, and like slowly make steps towards that. So then I'm like, that's where the infill is. It's like, I don't need to like move. I don't need to sell everything and move to an eco village, which is yeah. like this, like, oh, it's going to be perfect when I get there. I land there and everything's going to be perfect. You know? <laughs> but it's guess what? It's not. So rather yeah. than that, and that's kind of it's actually like, more difficult <laughs> than probably because it's so unfamiliar. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to discount that. I think if I was young and I didn't have a lot of attachments to where I am, you know, I, I'm not against that idea. I think uh, a lot of eco villages can use more people also. So I think that's one op- one option on the list. But we also need the infilling. We also need a lot of people who are just willing to stay where they are and even though it's frustrating and there doesn't seem to be a lot of inroads just stick with it and like if you're good at like talking to the city or the county politicians do that you know to try Mm -hmm. and improve uh you know maybe the the gray water zoning or the green building zoning you know like there's there's so many different things that can people can work on um Mm -hmm. and that's sort of more the infilling model of wherever you are, work on strengthening the bonds in that community. Even if it seems like for a lot of us, like that's almost impossible. Like nobody wants it. I think people want it. We just don't even know what we want because we haven't seen Mm -hmm. it in so long. Mm -hmm. So provide those opportunities. We think that this model that we've had with the the roads and the interstates is like always been the case, but we forget that it's only about 60 years old. 60, 70 years old. It's, 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 mm. what, it's the reality that we're living in is relatively new and uh, it can change yeah. just as fast. And so we got to we got to decide, you know, collectively is, oh, what do we want? And within communities, what do we want? What are the needs? And what do people really what is going to help people? Um, I want to ask you more about your mission. Uh, okay. So in the process with the mission. Now, I know you formed a group in Slack called Out Communities and that Nikki Wall and uh, you mentioned Carl Welty was in there and there mm-hmm. were a couple other people. Yeah. Um, but you had some challenges uh, getting your mission going. Is that correct? I guess so. What Part of what I felt was that I would have enjoyed having more time to um, consolidate the missions rather than have so many to mm. merge them into a smaller amount of missions. Uh, I felt like there was some excessive redundancy and mm-hmm. that like, um, I wouldn't have, I thought for a moment that I would support another mission. Um, so that was one thought too, is that I might just be better suited to support another mission. And the timing was a little bit uh, challenging for me, like just to work with the Difficult time to sync with people. Yeah. Difficult yeah, to sync with yeah. people. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, so those were a few things. Um, and then I kind of felt like I was maybe I didn't I didn't see the resources in the group that were specific to what I was looking for. Right. Which would, would be like somebody who knows a lot about coding and um, 
algorithms related to crawling and uh, collecting, synthesis, aggregating data from other existing sources. It's a okay. pretty specific tool set, I guess. Um, and so I thought maybe if that had emerged from the group somehow, then um, then then I'd be able to move forward. But that was the really a specific. I do know a guy from New York who I probably should call, um, who's got that skill set. Um, so. You were thinking about making Earth and Heart LLC into someone had mentioned like an Airbnb for community homesteading. Is that accurate? Yeah. And so one question is, would it actually make sense to reach out to Airbnb? They already got the adventures thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that they did some emergency housing stuff where they just, you know, they were, people were offering housing for free during a disaster relief type of, so they have the infrastructure in place. Would they then Mm -hmm. be interested in partnering with landowners around the world to offer something along the lines of uh, IC.org, Eco Village Network, or um, the Woof Network, where there's, let's say, there's a work trade option. There's a, um, it, you know, short term, like seasonal, uh, this person has a certain crop and they need somebody for three months to help them harvest garlic, you know, like to set that up through Airbnb, use the existing infrastructure of Airbnb rather than reinvent the wheel. Or is Airbnb like not really a good organization to give that amount of uh, resource? You know, I don't know enough about Airbnb to know if they're like, if they need more traction. I guarantee you Lauren Manis from uh, Regeneration Pollination probably knows someone who's already doing an Airbnb-like thing, more like what you describe. I'd be interested to see yeah? if that connection could be made. Okay, send me that later, please. Yeah, it'll be it'll be upcoming. I'm interviewing her on Thursday. So, oh, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, okay, so you had your project, and um, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me was that you mentioned your chef... Um, you're cooking, and that was one of the things that you kind of were interested in at Arcosante. And mm-hmm. you are a part of Food Salon. Can you tell me more about that? Okay, so that's not really a thing yet, but uh, I do have the website, foodsalon.us. It's just a, it's just a domain that I have uh, tucked away for three years so far. Um, so it's not totally manifest yet. Um, what I've been doing for the last 10 years is uh, creating value-added foods. So um, that's anytime you take a produce like uh, blueberries or whatever, and you turn them into something else. So hmm. blueberry jam would be a value-added food. Oh, um, okay. But also um, fermented foods, lacto-fermented foods, uh, vinegars, uh, fruit leathers. I make like... Uh, this one with squash because there's always just a, an abundance of squash. It's got apples and squash and spices. So it's kind of got that uh, nutmeg, cinnamon, you know, uh, fall time flavor to it. Uh, that's like a pumpkin leather. Um, I've been making vegan pemmican. So that's got uh, different herbs in it as well as uh, so when I'm making juice, I have pulp left over. Then the pulp. Uh, I can add things to that, like flaxseed or um, different things, and then dry that out in a paper. So there's mm-hmm. a, it's kind of like a ve- vegan pemmican. Pemmican is generally using uh, deer tallow and, and different things from animals, but um, this is a, cool. a vegan option. So Excellent. I've been doing a lot of that. And then I started partnering with churches and farmers I did that awesome. for th- three years. So I would source from a farm, then go to a church and um, look for volunteers and process basically bumper crops um, from a farmer and um, and then try to get, get the food back into the community or to friends and family or whatever. And uh, I got mm-hmm. in over my head, uh, so I kind of <laughs> backed out for a while. Um, Uh and I, and I was like, I didn't have, um, very much skilled help in the kitchen. So I was like training people with basic kitchen skills and whatnot. So how to kitchen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very ba- yeah, basic level. Is you not the best use of your time for So scale. yeah, I kind of pulled back <laughs> from that. I still do it on a home homestead level like I've got mm-hmm. aronia berry juice and apple juice and uh different leathers and tons of vinegars and kombuchas and stuff. I've always got fermented uh cabbage and cauliflower and things. So I I've, I've got my just home homestead level, but so I've been wanting to scale that up. I still think the churches is the way to go because they've always I got agree. kitchens ready well, to go. Well, and explain why. Explain why with churches. Well, there's lots of reasons. One is because they have kitchens that are generally available, you know, other mm-hmm. than Sunday afternoon. They're fully booked or, you know, they generally yeah, the have a the week they're empty. fair amount of time where it's empty. And then no. also, I'd say perhaps the biggest reason is because they're generally off the radar of, you know, um, having to comply with a lot of federal regulations and whatnot. So mm. the interest I have in, I, for, for two years, I, I functioned as a farmer. I filed a Schedule F with, with mm. Urban Heart um, and I did the whole farmer thing and picked blueberries, uh, paid people to pick them and then drove them to the market or went to farmer's markets and did all that. And, um, Mm -hmm. for me, it wasn't really manageable, um, in my reality, especially blueberries in particular was my crop and trying to, trying to remain competitive in that market here, uh, Mm -hmm. was a downward kind of spiral largely because of the incoming, uh, I think Chilean and Argentinian berries. Yeah, and those are probably you know pretty well organized by now. Yeah, if they're being imported, so it's, it's a new compete. thing. It's a new thing, yeah. and and you could see it like how it, how it kind of affected the the market. But anyway, there was a lot of reasons why I didn't want to be a farmer, and I I deeply um, revere those who are farmers and i know how much work it is so if someone calls me a farmer i'm like i cannot accept that title because it's a lot of freaking work and i don't do that (laughs) well you know the other thing i want to say about churches is that you have a group of people who are in pretty tight community together usually who Mm -hmm. want to help they want to volunteer they want to do good in the world and so i feel like if churches can be mobilized for positive ecological reasons um, that that is something that is in alignment with the, the, the yeah. core group ethos as well as in alignment with the planet. So I see Absolutely. this opportunity. There are so many groups interwoven around the world that could be doing such good. Um, so I think, and, you know, I think back to, um, you know, grandmothers who were in churches doing canning and, you mm-hmm. know, the things like that. I mean, some of those values still exist in some of these groups. So it might be very, um, com- you know, it might be already something that you can come in and support. Okay, so in your community homesteading project, you mentioned the benefits of community homesteading as improved lifestyle. On-site production of food is increased. Health is increased. Energy and culture, which is one of the things we were talking about before. And reduced expenses and waste. Mm -hmm. I want you to teach me about sustainable living. I oh boy! I know very little, so I I'm less a sponge. I'm just excited. Just share your experience with me. What all right. what is this all about? Well, I'm, first off, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because right now I'm actually living in a single family home, and it's just me and sometimes my daughters. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not living the life that I personally would like to be living. This is my mother's house. She passed three years ago. I inherited it. I'm fixing it up, probably sell it in another year or so. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not claiming to have it all figured out, but I do like mm-hmm. to share what I've experienced. Um, so the property, Earth and Heart LLC Community Homestead, uh, that is uh, a rental property for me for the last three years or so. Yeah. So I don't live on site, but I do tend the property, like prune the fruit trees and manage the food trails and, and plant things and, and make uh, permacultural interventions and teach those mm. who are interested in uh, learning about the plants that are there and try to make people aware of what's there. So they're not, you know, removing things or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. So that's my role, and it's it's basically um, periodic uh, arrival on site and and staying in the. It's a twenty acre property, so probably eighteen acres of it are 
uh, open land. So that's what I, that's my role now is specifically in the land. And honestly, that was always my greatest interest is uh, being in the soil and having positive interventions on the ecosystem. It's like generally the environmental movement from my experience, including some of the heroes of the movement, like Greta Thunberg, um, is fairly misanthropic. It's like humans suck, you know? It's ah, like, true. well, <laughs> no, we've been trained to suck. That's um, right. In reality, not only can we minimize our impact, but we can have a net imp- positive impact. Like yeah. a real simple example is water wants to rush down a hill. Yes, And as it's doing that, it takes all the topsoil, puts it in a valley, usually adds more nutrients to that area than it needs. So it gets oversaturated with nutrients. You get algae Mm. pools and things like that. All the topsoil from here rushes down. So you get sort of undesirable patterns of uh, soil distribution. Uh, Interesting. And that's if you leave it alone to natural occurrence but humans can cut into the land on the slope on the contour lines and make the water kind of hang store the water in these terraces you see those like in china a lot of them in asia the terraced um Mm -hmm. yeah the hills and stuff central america as well Yeah, yeah yeah so banking the water that's like generally specifically for agriculture and certain crops but um if you plant trees in that environment, even like in a desert or something, and the water gets banked, you can grow things that wouldn't normally grow. Mm. And um, so it allows a it, it allows humans and non-human life to thrive even more than before via yeah. a human intervention. So we can have a net positive impact. And so that's like always been I agree. probably the most exciting thing to me about the whole thing is like having, um, having an ability to do something that, you know, possibly 50, a hundred years from now, if, if I can actually see that far, which is difficult, you know, mm-hmm. um, and to make it, make an intervention with that in mind for who knows whose benefit down the road, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's my main reason for doing it. It reminds me of a quote I often heard Amanda Joy Ravenhill say, and I don't know if she originated it, but the idea that um, we would like to see humanity go from apex predator to apex gardener. Mm -hmm. And I think that sums it up. I mean, and, you know, I guess to uh, to the idea of misanthropy, it's it is it's a big challenge within the ecological movement. It's also a big reason why a lot of people resist ideas of making climate interventions and things like that. It's kind of, you know, this self-protection of nature. Well, you know, mm. you, you, I don't suck. You're saying humans suck. I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to buy into someone who's just going to, you know, take away all the progress that we've made as humanity. I don't want to live in a hut, you know, blah, blah, blah. Kind of just what we talked about before. So I think you got to be really careful um, if you're trying to care for the planet. There always will be humans on the planet, barring a mass extinction event, even if there is like massive upheaval in humanity and we're going to continue mm. to have an impact so we might as well design for the optimal state of humanity versus the uh you know i mean we could all live in mag we could end up in mad max i mean that's one potential future and i don't think that one's very ecologically friendly i mean aside no. for maybe the population being small um so <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know you could look at this as, as a design challenge misanthropy short of a major mass extinction is not helping the planet <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> So I've experienced it, you know, for periods of times, it's been weeks or months at a time where the right alignment of people and energies, I would say uh, at Earth and Heart, there's been maybe like nine to 15 people there and somehow the right balance occurred and it's, it's mysterious, but there is some kind of, I definitely wouldn't say formula. Um, but I've, I've got a lot of grids and formulas that I've been working on over the years. So I, I do try, I'm a systems guy. So I do try to create systems that would heighten the possibility of things, you know, working out. 
But there is a mysterious element to it. And I've experienced it where it's like people are there. They want to be there. It's the right balance of, okay, we're out there maybe doing some work in the gardens. And somebody's like at 11 o'clock. They're like, oh, maybe I should go cook some food for everybody so that by the time everybody's hungry, you know, there's there's a meal and we're not like all taking a break and then having to cook. Somebody's like, that's right. Yeah. It's like telepathic. It's really actually there's a telepathic thing that happens to me when it's really um, flowing properly, where it's like you're at a dinner party and somebody's hosted this party. And clearly it was a lot of work, even though. You wouldn't know it, but they had to clean their place. They'd invite everybody. And there's yeah. a pile of dishes. You know, if you go in there and you knock out the dishes, it's going to help out the situation for that person. If you ask them, they might be like, oh, no, I got it. You know, but That's then right. when the party's over, they got a pile of dishes to work on. <laughs> That's not even really telepathic. That, But, you know, to be aware of these yeah. things and to try to, like, see forward a little bit to like and to think about what all the members of the group um, might want possibly Mm -hmm. to ask people. But a lot of times it's just uh, increased perception. So I've experienced. I think what you're talking about is being connected. Yeah. And that can include, you know, anticipating and that includes, Mm -hmm. you know, noticing. And it also can include the synchronistic as well. I think, you know, as you open up to the greater connection, I think you're just open so. anticipatory design science yeah <laughs> so organizing the day i would have people arrive some who really wanted clear i don't want to say orders but clear expectations okay i'm staying here you're giving me a place to stay i would like you to provide one meal in the evenings and i work four hours a day so in the morning they wanted tasks you know, that they were accountable for, you know, clear like, expectations, almost like a military, very like, yeah, by the book arrangements clear. And then other people that were like, downright offended by any of that game, more <laughs> like kind of anar- anarchist kind of people, um, some of whom seem to have a lot of beef on their shoulders and other people who had these mysterious actually all of them even the ones who had the beef um had mysterious gifts who if i was open to it would just drop them right when i needed them like one time i was teaching somebody how to split wood when i was such a rookie myself and Uh um i had the wood i was splitting on a concrete slab and i was hitting it with um hitting with a maul and showing them the difference between an axe and a maul and and uh using a sledgehammer with wedges, like three different ways that you can split wood. And Mm -hmm. uh, this guy, Steve, who was very academic, I think he's working on his PhD, but just really out there guy, but really nature savvy too. He was just kind of looking at me in the corner of his eyes, like in his hammock and (laughs) reading his book. I was kind of, part of me was probably wondering like, is this guy really, is he doing anything around here? You know, like, but um he came over and he's like, you know, you should have that. You should have a, a log that you're splitting on that's not on that concrete because you're you're gonna keep splitting your uh, the the wood, the handle. Plus, right. You know, if you don't want to split on concrete because the the response when you hit it goes right into your arms and you that's break right. your your shafts and all that. Yeah. So he's like, here, just put. He put this big stump on the ground he's like put the wood on top of here and now proceed i'm like okay and i could have done that for like (laughs) five more years you know and it's like maybe he didn't do anything all day and he just offered that one little gift but that could have saved me just an incredible amount of time and agony and and broken handles and such and such so broken bones (laughs) so to provide for those all those different ways that people like to roll and all the way Mm -hmm. that people can offer their gifts you know because not everybody's it's like with schooling like not everybody fits into the standardized testing thing i've got one daughter who does great with that and another who just that's not her thing and like to make people fit into the same box is a terrible waste of our collective uh, capacity you know to do that yeah 
celebrating diversity within yeah. community and learning to design for it, learning to anticipate it. Mm -hmm. People are different. There's some people who excel at they need a plan. There's some people who need to not plan so that something can right. emerge. And uh, that's that, you know, very well studied psychology, but we all forget and we all think everyone's like us. Mm. And I guess that leads me to my final point about collaboration. One of the things that I've noticed that has been a challenge as we all learn to do online, which is great because I meet you and you're in Michigan and I'm in California and I'm part of the Buckminster Fuller Institute uh, space camp, which I wouldn't be able to do without Zoom and all those things. But there are dozens of online collaboration tools and I've noticed that there is a varying degree of tech savviness within that. So certain people have less access uh, to the conversation or they insert themselves differently into the conversation based on the shared digital spaces that we use. Mm. Um, you mentioned, kind of a side note, you mentioned that uh, you, uh, since 1998, have been uh, doing pri Primal Digital and uh, you wanted to talk about that as well. So I think we mm. can kind of like pair the two together in this last part of the conversation. You know, one of the challenges that I found is like for me, email's bad because if somebody puts me on a group email, it's like overwhelming and my ADD goes crazy. I don't know if I have ADD, but anyway, I just it, I can't focus. It's I lose it. It's somewhere off over there and I, I can't keep up with a thread. But on Slack, I can just come in and go, OK, what did I miss? And it just in the channel, like just in alt communities, if I just wanted to check on that, which I did the other day to prep for the, the interview. And it was great. But then other people I know who, who mm. come into Slack, they can't use it. Notifications don't work. They forget it's there. And so they go, OK, well, I've been in space camp for three weeks, but nothing's happening. And it turns out everything was happening on Slack. <laughs> and so, you know, that's yeah. the challenge huh. of these digital spaces is they're they're very, very empowering, but they're also very not not equally native to people and there can be a lot of right. you know not everyone's minds work the same so i mean mm. i think y you might understand you know sort of the design challenge and that is a passion of mine like just just how do we define just like with arco santi and you know these um communicate how do we def define what people are doing and where they're valuable but also how they have opportunities to interact mm. where they're meeting um whether or not they're meeting if they're in if they're 10 miles away they're not going to meet you know if they're if we're all walking. Um, so yeah. some of the practicalities of these huh. uh, interconnected community, if we want to start to become an intercooperating species, uh, which the internet is allowing us to do more and more, and we're going to be intentional about that. I'm curious mm -hmm. your perspective on some of those design challenges that we find on building projects and communities online. Yeah, first thing that comes to mind is... Uh... I got a degree in management from the School for International Training in Vermont, mm. uh, which is part of world learning and the first uh, study abroad program, the experiment in international living. Uh, anyway, I got one of the courses I took was um, management of information technology, I believe it was called, but mm -hmm. uh, studying IT or ICT, um, information communication technology, and uh, the different reasons for it and different implement uh, implementation strategies. So I think a surprising, a surprisingly overlooked component of it is why am I using this technology? Hmm. I think so many times we just pick it up and it's there and everyone else is doing it. So mm -hmm. I got to do it too because everyone else is doing it. Well, you don't hmm. actually have to. Um, hmm. Uh, so if you take that on a personal level, that's one thing, but then on an organizational level, uh, when I was in New York city, we adopted pretty cutting edge technologies. And if you've got like 50 systems that were just installed that are like cutting edge experimental technology, uh, it can be pretty hard to support that, you know, it probably would yeah. have made more sense to just install one of those and stick with 48, you know. 48, 49 of the stable ones and like try one out first, but right. there was reasons for what we did, but why are, why am I on Slack? Why am I on Telegram? Why am I on whatever? Like not just cause everyone else is doing it, but what's unique about it, you know, it, mm -hmm. or why am I on a zoom call? Is it cause I'm lonely? Is it because I, uh, ah, good question. I'm looking for work. Is it, you know, yeah. 
like actually the core why am i doing this you know and it's not necessarily just one reason but like what what are the reasons for my using this instead of like i have to do this because everybody else is doing it well do you yeah. Well, and what are the reasons that that particular platform that may have been designed for one thing, why is the community on that platform? And a lot yeah, of times well, that defines. So you have the core technology, which does a thing, but then you have the group and community that's, that's sort of coalesced around that technology, and that becomes its own beast yeah. in a way. Like, yeah. Discord, I think, is mainly like Web 3.0 kind of crowd. Is that? It seems to be. But some people are using it differently. But like yeah, crypto it started with and gamers, like coders, gamers, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. like people who like there is there is a dark side or a, a trade off to everything being so simple. You know, like mm-hmm. it used to be you actually used to know how to code or do something with a computer. Like now you just turn it on and nobody knows anything about what's running around in the background. Unless you yeah. go to view the source or whatever, but mostly nobody codes. It's like all in the background. And for the most part, that democratizes it, makes it more um, accessible. But it also means there's all kinds of stuff running in the background that people have no idea what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I think there's different platforms. And that, that'd be the first thing is like, why am I using this versus that? You know, medium is the message, right? Marshall McLuhan. Um, yeah sort of uh a phone call is different than an email and right gener- generally older generations are going to be more comfortable with the uh email i mean i used to write all kinds of letters i don't know it's so rare now to receive or to send a letter but to have a handwritten letter from mm. somebody is so personal mm-hmm. you know it's really a, yeah an amazing lost art almost um <laughs> that i miss a little bit but once the email came out, it's like, I can send that message, just blip, done, save a stamp. Mm-hmm. Like, why mm-hmm. would I continue to write letters? Yeah. So, you know, why are we using these unique platforms and what, what distinguishes one from the other? I don't know. Like, we're on um, Squadcast versus Zoom, and I now understand this platform. I've been wondering, so thanks for sharing yeah. this with me. I didn't know what else was out there besides Zoom because they kind of have the dominant market well, on i this. wouldn't i wouldn't use squadcast if we were just hanging out or if we were doing some sort of class or something that we weren't recording this is specifically for podcasts and mm-hmm. podcasts are a unique medium because people can take us with them in their cars and their ears while they're doing dishes while they're doing lawn folding laundry right. and they can be with us in this conversation and that's one of the things that people love about podcasting it's personal like radio now one of the reasons i went for the video format on this was i understood that the greater Buckminster Fuller community uh, that might be listening to this uh, benefits from the visual aspect. They need to see us where I'm the kind of person like my podcast, The Language of Creativity, I do audio only on purpose and people have asked me to do video, but I'm like, no, my guests can't get as vulnerable and as comfortable if there's just something about the intimacy of the voice. Now, um, so Squadcast allows me to get high quality audio and high quality video, uh, but there's things that, you know, uh, like I think Wheelow is better for um, one of the uh, participants in Space Camp has been advocating Wheelo, and an inter- guest that I interviewed about VR had said that um, basically it's interesting when you're on Zoom, you end up with Zoom fatigue because mm-hmm. you're, you're sitting there on the screen, you, you can't get up and move around. But somehow when you're a little avatar walking around this fake cafe and you can sit down in a chair, you expand your energy the way you would if you were sitting in person and so you relax more and you're not just mm-hmm. focused on a screen. And so you said like the medium is the message and it's so true. I mean, we're probably talking about things now to frame this conversation around community homesteading and around the space camp that we would not be doing if we didn't have that context reining it in you and i were just talking there's you know we probably drift around a lot more right so it's 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 true and you know i think with discord um one of the values i see about slack and discord is uh what's called asynchronous communication so the fact that people can type stuff at times that are comfortable for them you know maybe they're in australia they're in another time zone maybe i don't like to be online at 8 a.m in the morning because i don't want to put out there what my 
tired brain is going to do. So I wait, but then I can still see you could post something. What's at six in the morning for me because it's you're in the East Coast, and then I can come back to that and I can still interact with it and it's threaded. And for my brain, like alt communities is in a different thread than general, which is in a different thread than inspiration, which is in a different thread than uh, loving eats. So I can kind of keep things contextualized mm -hmm. in a way that I couldn't if we were just in one large group text. It'd just be all over the place, and somebody may, somebody may be in the mood to joke, and they might put a joke in there, but it might actually disrupt a communication, because we have to remember about these digital mediums, and this is one of the problems with Facebook and the usability of Facebook, is that in these digital mediums, we're not in a room together. In fact, we're not even face to face like we are now. So the problem with that is, is that, you know, you, the, you miss out on the opportunities for someone to go, hey, um, I think I'm going to go make lunch for everybody you know, while everyone's keep working so that there's food when those, th those there's cues get missed, yeah. you sort of get disconnected from your body. You get disconnected from each other. You get disconnected and it's all about ideas and there's nothing wrong with that. It's super stimulating, but also we run We fall into the traps of, you know, inadvertent dehumanization when we don't have access to the other cues, mm -hmm. uh, which for some That's people, well, is, well put. Yeah. And which for some people is actually safer. I mean, we find that a lot of, mm -hmm people a lot of people need that sort of sense of safety from you know maybe a, an environment where they're not as well cued in but online but they're like okay i can that. express myself you it's know it's like a chicken and, or the egg like you say people need that and i hear that but is mm -hmm. it also encouraging that you know you know it could be both but i i feel like for me the big benefit of the internet has been being able to connect with these ideas that and and to mix with more ideas than i have access to in my immediate vicinity yeah. no i totally agree um yeah. but you know i would ask the question you know if you were in a community homesteading discourse group or discord group mm -hmm. um you know online would the guy in the hammock have mentioned the thing about the axe you might not have even thought to post about axing on concrete. And so that's one of the uh, the um, immediate values of having people in your own vicinity and community. And like, you know, yeah. you don't always know what people bring to the table. And, you know, it's just one of, the, like I said, diversity through, um, you know, strength through diversity. I think, you know, there's so much uh, and I think there's so much wisdom that's offline. There's so many people who aren't on the Slack channel or yeah, the Discord and we need channel. The, that word because global. The, there's you know a that certain word global. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, go mean, ahead. I, th I think it's time to reclaim that that movement or that word global. Like like you're saying, there's things that can be done on the global platform that are uh, unavailable in our immediate surroundings. You know, so. But that doesn't mean that we should neglect our backyard. So to mm -hmm. have a have a global event, let's say it's about you know um, food systems, you know. Mm -hmm. So you got maybe people who are foraging experts. You got breakout mm -hmm. groups that are based in certain regions or uh, climate analogs, which is a whole different thing. So like I'm in a climate analog with parts of Eastern Europe, Japan, Siberia, because I'm in the climate zone, you mm -hmm. know, but. Yeah, you, know, you can break out into different groups, talk about community gardens, food market, like uh, farmers markets, local farms, etc. But do it in a global context, and then ground it in your in your neighborhood, and then yeah. maybe every every month feed back into this global network and right. share learnings. So I really think it's a prime time to to do these kind of global events, and that's part of the the food salon idea is that. This would be a particularly the first one that we're working on is in Gary, Indiana, but it could happen anywhere on the planet, really. It's just about mm. coordinating with uh, churches, local farms and foodies from different sectors. So like yeah. to have that both, you know, not either yeah. or, but it is online event that's anchored in a local event. So, yeah, the, the guy giving me the tip, uh, splitting wood put that on some sort of resource resource online that's uh related to wood lots you know wood lots are yeah. related to uh forestry uh you know the mechanics of splitting wood making lumber uh heating in the north etc cetera, etc cetera. so somewhere in there just make sure that little note gets 
put in the right section so that if somebody's like managing their wood lot, they can go in there and maybe they're a rookie like I was and Mm -hmm. they actually don't know that 101 (laughs) tip, you know, but feed it into the collective wisdom garden basically Mm -hmm. um, to take some words from some friends of mine who you should know about. Um, That's a, who are they? Mention their names. Well, it's, it's via my friend, Charles Blass and, um, working with Nora Bateson. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a pretty vast network of people. Colonel are the code people uh, who are working on specific, uh, different ways of integrating the, the data part of it. Warm data, warm data is a uh, Nora Bateson's concept, which has to do with sitting with the data. So you take a survey, um, but how do you really get meaningful, experiences information uh conclusions or what have you from that data by sitting with it and um not just drawing trite conclusions um that fit the needs of the researcher you know right right yeah oh it sounds to me like this is about Mm cross-pollination and it also seems it occurs to me that the importance of people who can share knowledge, techniques, information, ideas, passions with each other and help to bridge them between people and groups. So, for example, you know, that person who has a wealth of knowledge that's in the, based in the older, but they work in the older forms of communication may be helping that person, somebody who can kind of come alongside them and help them get on your Zoom and help them to participate in the group yeah. and have a voice. Because I feel like people who have a lot to say miss out on their having their voice because of these, you know, not being digitally native or, you know, mm. these, uh, 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 so many platforms. For heaven's sake, I could hardly make a crypto wallet and I used to build my own computers. So there is varying degrees of this all over the the map. And, you know, some people mm. are going to choose to be intentionally offline. And so if you're one of those people who knows that person and you're learning all these things cross-pollinating from around the world, you mentioned Siberia and all these different techniques and things, you'll, you'll th- then be the library for that person when mm. you go to their homestead and you meet them and you talk to them and you can yeah. share that information and bring that into places where they can. Again, you know, so much diversity within humanity and so much potential. And Julian, I want to thank you for being on the Spaceship Earth Mission Log. Um, yeah. Where can people find out more about Earth and Heart and Primal Digital? And I guess a final thing, like what what people are you looking for to help you collaborate with this ongoing? Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. So uh, those are both domains that I hold. So earthandheart.com, E-A-R-T-H-E-N.com, and Primal Digital, P-R-I-M-A-L digital.com. And then foodsalon.us is just a, I just have the domain at this point. There's no website up there yet, but hopefully there will be soon. So those are all places you can go. And then uh, my email is first initial last name so it's j l a u z z a n a at gmail.com for now i'm still on the google and i guess the uh the thing that i'm looking for most in terms of collaboration i'm at a point where i can't really scale up in any meaningful fashion not that scaling up is always appropriate but i believe it is at this point in time for this particular project of community homesteading due to just my limited ability to be a property manager basically um so i'm looking for partners in the realm of the model is basically to have a secure tenant who has some skills in basic um maintenance and repair type of thing so there's not always a call for every small little thing that occurs uh, to bring down the day-to-day requirements of the property owner and then looking for investors to uh, to get more properties or people who already have land Uh, i think a lot of people have have made the dive in the last few years to purchase land but maybe they don't have their their um 
their game totally figured out yet in terms of what they're going to be doing. So talking with those people also, and then, you know, uh, coordinating with the groups who are connected with people who are interested in the uh, experience of, I would say for a, you know, three to six month trial period generally seems to be kind of a good way to start if somebody's never lived on the land kind of thing. Um, don't get too glossy eyed about it of uh, dreamy. <laughs> <hard> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, people who are interested in that and then also the people who are, have been doing it um, for decades, generally old farmers, but even, uh, you know, someone like myself who's been at it a little over 10 years um, and figured out some of the, the nuances of the lifestyle. So, also those people who can offer uh, mentorship in some degree to the newcomers. So there's a network of people, um, but there's investors, there's people who might be sort of the anchor of the community uh, who would have a formal lease with the landowner. Mm-hmm. So investors, that person who would, I'd say, primary land steward, then uh, people who are interested in the short-term visit, and then also mentors who have been who have a lot of skills in homesteading. So mm-hmm. all those components, and there's probably other ones that you know could be uh, considered as well. But that sort of blend of people, and I'm I'm basically uh, coordinating people from those different uh, fields. Also, there's you know realtors and just looking at land all the time and keeping an eye on that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited just to talk with people who are interested in any one of those aspects. And I'm, I kind of, a lot of times I'll just put people together and they're, and they, hmm. you know, I hear a year later or something that they're now, <laughs> now this person's living at this farmer's property. And wow. they're like, and that's like, they're, uh, there's this farmer I know who two of the people who started out with me, I then referred them to them and they're like, they never had a daughter but these both these women are like Aww. young women and they're like they have amazing relationships so a lot of times i'll so just cool. partner people together and i don't even have a direct relationship i just let them go at it because they have what they needed um or were they they were looking for because i have this kind of network of people that are in all those different fields and i'll just it doesn't have to be on this property or that it's the right synergy of events you know yeah and that's a mysterious thing i can't put my finger on it but um Mm -hmm. i guess i have some i have some skill at just kind of putting things together yeah yeah that's an important role well julian this was awesome to talk to you i hope you and i get to chat personally in the near future thank you for joining us on the spaceship earth mission log and podcast um, check us out Substack. You can subscribe uh, Spaceship Earth Mission Log on Substack. And of course, the Buckminster Fuller Institute, BFI.org, the uniting force behind the Trimtam Space Camp and the reason that we did these missions. Check it out. There's some really forward thinking work there. And uh, let's see humanity make a difference together. Mm.